Prior to the revolution, the Russian imperial court had reached its height in splendor and wealth. Amongst the nobility, there were fabulous displays of grandeur in balls, summer palaces, yacht parties, feasts, and more. They lived among gilt, marble and mirrors, waltzed in satin and jewels, and were attended by dozens of servants on palatial estates. Some worked in the state and in the army, while others were mere playboys. They could pursue military careers, become scholars, artists, university professors, authors, high-ranking civil servants, or they could just live off their family's capital. They could travel around the world. They hosted and attended intellectual salons, balls, hunts, collected art, ate good food, and wore beautiful clothes and expensive jewelry. Russia's aristocracy resided in exorbitant luxury. They lived in stone mansions in the cities and often had one or several country estates. Peter the Great forced his nobles to build second houses on the plots of land he gave them just outside the city. These fashionable villas used for socializing in the summer months were called dachas. Italian, French, and English architects were hired to build elegant palaces, gardens, and ballrooms. Their homes were extravagantly decorated with elaborate paintings, intricate carvings, initials, mythical creatures, and artistic renditions of animals and plants. In Russian noble families, the men made the decisions and were in control. They provided for the family and dictated daily activities. For a woman, marriage was the goal. Marriages were often arranged by the parents. They looked for someone of the same class or better, with aristocratic backgrounds. If a woman were to choose her husband, she was expected to select an upper-class man who she met at a social occasion. A wife's duties were to care for her husband, preside over the household, and bear children. The children were the property of a woman's husband. But unlike in other parts of Europe, Russian aristocratic women had the right to own property. Outward etiquette was a major priority. Manners were based on the norms of other European nations. Proper upbringing and strict etiquette were emphasized for children. Children were entrusted in the care of a nanny from among the peasant women. They were taught love of traditional national values and moral groundwork for a proper upbringing. Aristocratic boys and girls were taught reading and writing from a governess until the age of eight. Girls were taught French, geography, history, singing, piano, drawing, and needlework until the age of twelve. They were then further educated in fine arts of piano, singing, and dancing until seventeen or eighteen. Their social debut was the beginning of their adult lives. Secondary education was not available to girls. Ladies were constrained. Wealth, rank, connections, and looks dictated everything. Boys at the age of eight were sent to schools for secondary education. Most nobles could afford to educate their children at special schools, where they were usually taught in German or French, but not Russian. Whether discussing recent court gossip or military successes, the Tsar and nobles usually spoke French, which many spoke better than Russian. The Tsar and nobility went to great lengths to imitate the noble courts of Western Europe. Classical Europe played a large influence on what was seen as high culture. The Russian aristocracy took Western Europe as the model. The clothing required of high society women during this period were also Western European style, particularly derived from those emanating from Paris. In the days when Russia was one of the richest empires, the Russian elite was interested in fashion simply because they could afford everything. Fashion was another mean used by the imperial families to show off their superiority and power. Hierarchy and servitude were ingrained and extreme. Protocol was stifling. For instance, no Russian aristocrat could sit in the presence of superiors. The theaters were full of junior officers hanging about in case a colonel turned up and needed a seat. 
While nobles in the countryside often had relatively humble lifestyles, nobles in Moscow and St. Petersburg generally had great wealth and opportunity. The appearance of wealth and power was important to the nobility. Some families kept several homes on country estates, major cities, and along the Black Sea. Wealthier nobles also had their own palace hunting grounds and scores of servants. During the era of serfdom, some nobles were known to post a servant in each room of the mansion, whose only purpose was to open and close the door. The aristocracy lived increasingly away from their estates. In 1858, only 15 to 20 percent of Russian nobles lived in cities. By 1897, it was 47.2 percent. Residents in town left aristocrats desiring amusement. For recreation, the nobility enjoyed musical instruments, billiards, cards, and tennis. Hunting, fencing, and gambling were also popular pastimes among men. While carriage and sleigh rides were favorite activities for families, ballet started as modest family evenings with dancing with the accompany of the piano. The performances were quite dramatic. Opera was a popular art form among the aristocracy. Russian music previously consisted of folk songs and dances. When opera was introduced, composers were sponsored by the aristocrats. The opera, a creation of Renaissance Italy, was the place to see and be seen. It was the main entertainment for the Russian imperial court and aristocracy. The theater and horse races were also popular pastimes. Drawing room receptions, elaborate dinners, fondness for the opera and French wines, and Parisian fashions were all part of Russia's nobility. Meals were a grand occasion. The Russian table layout resembled the French and English. A la ruse was a table setting that made use of fruit and floral arrangements. Courses were not set out in advance. The hostess strived to maintain a balance between interesting topics while avoiding sensitive ones. Assigned seating was also a major consideration. Males and females would be directed to every other seat to disperse the flow of conversation. If the hostess wished to encourage a meeting between a particular pair, she might seat them next to or across from one another. In 18th and 19th century Russia, the social life of the aristocracy revolved around a series of high society balls and all the finery they entailed. Elegant postal invitations, gorgeous dresses, jewels, and other luxurious symbols of the high life. Balls were not just a place for dancing. People gathered there to have fun and socialize, while the older generation discussed political news or played card games. At the turn of the century, balls were augmented with opera, ballet, and musical performances. Charity balls were also held, where money was collected for people in need. The ball season started in late fall and lasted until spring, with the loudest balls taking place around February. Balls were also held over the summer. St. Petersburg boasted a number of palaces perfect for holding balls for the Russian court. The so-called Great Ball, which opened the entire ball season, was held in the hall of the Winter Palace. Small and medium-sized balls were organized at the Hermitage and at the Anakov Palace. In the summer, guests were invited to the Peterhof or to the palace of the Tsarsko Selo. Part of any woman's preparation for attending a ball involved researching the fashion journals of the day, most often French. The fashions for dresses came and went, but throughout the history of balls in Russia, fans remained an important accessory for female guests. The success of a social season was not just measured by the lavishness of the receptions and the finery of the guests, but also by the number of newly engaged couples at the end of it. The highlight of the noble social life in the cities was the Tsar's annual grand ball at the 1,500-room Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Here, 3,000 dignified guests enjoyed dancing, music, and rare foods. During the Grand Ball, the Tsar, 
Tsarina and the nobles ate appetizers, drank imported French champagne and British wine, and danced to the latest Russian, Italian, French, and German music. Aristocratic Moscow would spend summers abroad or in their country estates. The Russian aristocracy enjoyed social gatherings at their estates, picnics in the country, and trips to the seashore. They sometimes escaped the Russian winter by heading to warm climates in Venice and southern France. Parties were held at the Moscow Club during winter. They would gather there for the most brilliant balls. Many noble families were fabulously wealthy, although many lost their wealth through mismanaging or neglecting their estates. By the beginning of the 20th century, the vast majority of noble landowners were unable to support their families on the proceeds of their estates alone. Historians also blame absentee ownership and the insecurity of property for poor productivity on noble estates. The broad consensus is that Russian nobles were chronologically in debt. Many often lived beyond their income, preferred life in the city to residing on their estates, and were far more likely to engage in conspicuous consumption than to invest in the development of their holdings. After the October Revolution of 1917, the new Soviet government legally abolished all classes of nobility. The glittering ball gowns and elegant soirees cease to exist, and all that remains of Russia's nobility is the memory of a bygone era.